Guess what? Unlike Georgia and Arizona, there was not paper to look at, to prove the win or the loss. No paper. There was paper in some counties. We could have looked at some of it, but by the time that case wove through the courts and a judge said, okay, you can look at the paper ballots, the counties that had the paper ballots, the few, had destroyed them with impunity. Nothing was ever happened. Nothing was ever done about it. So the worst thing to me about this Stop the Steal movement, other than they hijacked the term election integrity, so I don't feel I can use it anymore, is that where were they when you could really steal an election with impunity and there was no way to check it? It's been going on since 2002, and I never heard a peep from the Republican Party because they were really happy gaining and holding power. Now, what did the Democratic Party do? Progressives went, oh my God, we're con we, we have people who support us, we're popular, but it's not showing up by fractions of percentages in state legislative races, in congressional districts, just enough to tip the balance of power. And the Democrats would tell us, now don't question our elections, it's paranoid, it's democracy, and you're gonna undermine confidence. Well, we've learned since that another word for confidence, for short, is con. And if you're naive, and if you're not vigilant, and if you think that you can trust people who show you that they will win by any means necessary, means that you don't want to take, like violence and theft and deceit, you're going to lose to them. So the progressives really got on board with this. Dolores, where I see you nodding, and I want to thank you publicly for being one of the first great national activists that understood the fix that we were in. And you lent us your support back when it was convincing to Congress. Anyway, one of the uh, worst, one of the silver linings, if, if there was any, to the past four years and the degradation of the presidency, of our politics, of America's moral character, though I would say some of the things we did all through the 2000s uh, managed to do some of that too. Well, it was that in the ruthless behavior of the executive and a Supreme Court that wanted a unitary executive and a Congress that didn't want to do anything but follow the uh, uh, commands of this unitary executive, we saw what ruthlessness was. And I think during this pandemic, Republicans have had a chance to reflect. They even want honest elections now because they understand without them, they really, their sins will catch up with them and they will be consigned to the dustbin of history. My father was a Republican. All right. Um, one of the things that we see, uh, progressives, by the way, unlike Stop the Steal, where they were nowhere to be seen, we were in the courts, we were in, as in Ohio, as in John Brakey will tell you what he did. We were in secretaries of state's office. We had a great one here, Deborah Bowen, that restored the paper ballot early 2006 to California and started the trend nationwide and gave us wind beneath our wings. We were on, Con uh, uh, on Con Capitol Hill. We were everywhere begging people to see we need to restore paper ballots or we're going to lose the republic. Yeah. They finally finally started to listen because they did think for a while, well, didn't the election of Obama prove that there's no more racism in America? Not really. That kind of naivete and, uh, was what allowed the Republican Party to pack the Supreme Court with the people that gutted the Voting Rights Act. Chief Justice Roberts says there's no more racism in America. Look, we have an African-American president. That was done by these tiny incremental shifts in paperless elections. And our party, unfortunately, stood by with too much trust when that happened. And progressives were brave in being smeared and ridiculed and rejected when we tried to restore the paper ballot. But we got it back. So we have an infrastructure now that we can use to make the people's voice be heard. Now what do we see? 
because the only way that you can suppress a real majority from showing up in election results is by, with paper ballots, making sure that paper ballots aren't cast by the majority. We have to make the majority look like the minority and the minority look like the majority. And now they have to do it old school, the old racist way. Really stop people from voting. It was easier inside the computer. It was clean. There was nothing to prove the lie. It was great, you know? And Americans would vote on these computer voting machines and they didn't even realize the danger. They were sold a bill of goods. Oh, it's so fast. We're voting on computers like I use at work and at home. Oh, my county government has become technologically savvy. This is forward progress. We had to fight all of that attitude. And while this red shift, they called it, went on, while Republicans took over state legislatures, the message to Democrats was, you're not popular. You're so fractious. You're not united, and God is not on your side. And we didn't have the money, the AM radio stations, those got bought up real quick, and Rush Limbaugh made conflict and politics a blood sport and got tons of stations, money. Fox News did the same on the people's airwaves. That should never have been sold to Rupert Murdoch. I don't really know how that happened, but that's how we got hornswoggled with Fox News. And then everybody piled on 24 hour news cycles that sells conflict and violence as the thing that's gonna keep you watching because you're nervous and you're in conflict with yourself and we're telling you everything is bad. And at the polls, we couldn't get the majority to show up because in incremental little jurisdictions, you could steal without paper as much as you wanted. That's what we're correcting now. I want to talk about the degradation of the candidates who rose to power and are holding power under these deceitful circumstances where they were convinced they're popular, the other side is not popular, they're godless Democrats. We saw it in the hearings of the most brilliant Supreme Court nominee. I can remember Katanji Brown Jackson. And those three Republican senators, Cruz, Hawley, and Graham, tried to smear her with repetitive wallowing in child pornography. And this was not a surprise to me because when you followed the Ahmad Arbery trial and at the last uh, final arguments, the defense lawyer for the three murderers said, four murderers, well, the long, dirty toenails of Amon Arbery. And I remember commentators going, what's, what's that have to do with anything? How strange. Lawyers knew it wasn't strange. There's a legal strategy. They teach it. Try to attach something disgusting to your opponent. It's a subconscious feeling, emotion. It's one of the deep, fundamental human emotions. And it will attach to your opponent, devalue your opponent's humanity. And your listeners, the people who are doing that devaluation of your opponent, don't even know it's happening. Just get in something disgusting. That's what those men tried to do to this brilliant judge. And they succeeded only in attaching the disgusting trigger to themselves. I will never think about them again without thinking about how much they enjoyed bringing up child pornography, ever. And Judge, uh, Judge Brown Jackson emerged unscathed. Yeah. So if the Republicans gave a damn about children, they'd have passed the Build Back Better Act. Yeah, they were so worried about the cost, but they're not worried about the cost during the tax cuts or during a war or during gun violence, discussions of how much that's costing us. They're just worried when it comes to helping families and children. So I want to blanket the media this year with the message that it's Democrats who protect children because we want it all on to protect the planet. You know, I weep when I see tornadoes taking out whole communities in the heartland, or when I see floods making river areas and coastal areas uninhabitable, and now the parched farms because it's too hot and the water has gone to fracking. There were people who were trying to spare us this. They were trying to prevent it. They saw it coming, they believed the science, and they brought it into their campaigns and they got defeated by this message 
that we're godless and we want to destroy the purity of the nation and its children. Wrong. We want planetary survival and we want the human experience to thrive, experiment to thrive, and democracy and nonviolence is the only way forward and elections are the nonviolent moment of golden opportunity. It was also Democrats, mostly, who warned that the continual buildup of a nuclear arsenal was not going to keep us safe. And what do we see now? War in Europe, brutal aggression, and what ties our hands? The nuclear arsenal. So it was never something to make us safe. We now know it's just an arsenal of suicide. We tried to warn, we've wasted a lot of money, and diplomacy is the only way forward. I know that diplomatic solutions don't please everybody, but it gives us time to raise children and to educate ourselves and to reflect the way the pandemic gave us time to reflect if we were lucky enough to survive it on what it means to see human development, to see our loved ones thrive or struggle even, but in our own homes where we love them and we learn from them as to how to live without violence. So that's my last thing. I want to say that take this reflection from the pandemic, take heart in the fact that progressives have won the infrastructure back. It's not perfect. John Brakey will talk to you about how he is still going to preserve it more accurately, but we have come far. And we are popular because democracy is worth saving, earth is worth saving, life is beautiful. Those of us who get to know it that way, while other people are being blown apart and we see it, that is a painful mystery, but I believe it is that pain that fuels our activism. Because what we know to be beautiful, we want to share. As I said, elections are the nonviolent golden opportunity We've restored the infrastructure, use it or lose it. Alan tells me we're going to revive the voters calendar for 2020 that was so popular and effective. It's a big research job, 6,000 counties and states, all their details and deadlines, websites where you can check up to the last minute that you're not going to fall into a trap that they've just set for you. Elections are not just election day, election season and you have to make a plan. The media picked it up, the DNC picked it up. From us, the progressives, Steve Rosenfeld, shout out to that journalist, he helped us so much. Um, and make a plan to vote. That, that began here, pretty much. So we, our vision is to let the people's voice be truly heard don't let the right divide us this time. I believe many of us have been lucky to see children come into our lives, especially during the pandemic. And uh, we see, I believe that babies come into the world thinking they've won the lottery, regardless of their circumstances. This is it, a human life, a chance at self-actualization, self-experience, knowledge for their knowledge, maybe even a chance to, to make amends, maybe a chance to do some kind of nonviolent, even joyful justice in the spiritual and the physical universe. Democrats are trying to save the planet so that can keep happening. So thank you for having that vision with me, holding it, and let us kick ass this year. <laughs> Thank you, Mimi. God, it doesn't get any better than this. I want to point out, Mimi, um, in 2004, when they were stealing the election, Bob Fatrakis and I put out this book about, uh, it's about 108 different ways they stole the election in Ohio 2004. And we got the highest compliment you can ever get from Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut, I got to know Kurt Vonnegut in the last year of his life, and he read this book. And he announced, um, this explains how they stole the Ohio election in 2004 in Ohio. And he, around that time, soon thereafter, he announced that he was not gonna speak on campuses anymore 
But the kids at Ohio State convinced him to give one more speech. And Kurt Vonnegut came to Columbus and, uh, with virtually no publicity and 4,000 students showed up to see him. So they, he filled a hall with 2,000 people and then they had a, a, a spillover hall where they ran a video. And he sits up on a stage and he starts off and they, the, the format was he didn't give a speech, he sat there and they asked him questions. So he's sitting on the couch and he starts off and he says, he was very gruff, he says, um, can I speak my mind? And they, and they said, oh, well, that's what you're here for. And he said, and he held up this book. I swear I couldn't make this up. He held up this book and he said, what's the difference between Bush and Hitler? This was George W. Bush. What's the difference between George W. Bush and Adolf Hitler? This like stunned silence. And he says, Hitler was elected. <laughs> so there you go. That's straight from straight from Kurt Vonnegut. I want to acknowledge, where did Alan, Min Alan, Alan Minsky. I want to say, Alan Minsky, thank you so much. And you'll come up later, say a few words, okay? But Alan Minsky has been running the, uh, come on up, Alan, has been running the PDA Zoom. I want to thoroughly embarrass you. Um, <laughs> and you'll say a few minutes. Uh, if you actually just say us a couple minutes real quick for about PDA. We are now on the P Progressive Democrats of America Zoom. And I want to tell you that I just got a phone call from CBS and they're preempting the Oscars to run this. So this will be all over the world. I'm just, just wanting you to know. Uh, so Alan is the, uh, the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, one of the great activists in all of America. And because of him, we're now going live on Zoom. Alan, just say a couple words if you would, please. I haven't seen Drive My Car, but it seems like a very, very interesting film. It's rooted in a checkoff play, Uncle Vanya. No, I suppose I'm not supposed to talk about that. Okay. Um, so, Joel Siegel. First of all, it's incredible to be around Joel Siegel. And, um, yeah, and, and right off the bat, um, I, it's just astonishing to be able to have PDA partner with GREEP, which is the best acronym since CREEP. <laughs> um, the committee to reelect the president, the acronym that proved somehow the Nixon administration sort of had a sense yeah. of humor, I suppose. Yeah, right. um, Tom English, it's so great to be here with you, Tom. Well, Tom. And and in seeing Tom, I just need to acknowledge our co-founder uh, Lila Garrett, uh, who passed. Um, Lila was so wise; she had so much just spiritual wisdom as Lila Garrett that she lived a long and one of the most fulfilling lives imaginable. For those who don't know, she's the inspiration for the Barbra Streisand character in the movie, right. The Way We Were. Right. Um, and she had the, the COVID pandemic. I think she left this mortal, her mortal coil a couple weeks before it hit, uh, which actually, again, in all of her earthly wisdom and just co cosmological wisdom, she uh, is, is something we all should take note of because uh, we have to take better care of ourselves and our planet. Uh, we have to be aware of how things like our destruction of the climate is going to produce more pandemics. And Lila was Lila Garrett Presente for sure. And so, um, yeah. And and also Peter Matthews, I see here. I've got some good news for Peter Matthews. He's running for office in the 42nd district. And no, I'm not going to announce a PDA endorsement that goes through a process. That's a very interesting race. And there are about four people who are claiming the progressive lane, and at least two of them who I think are doing so uh, in great sincerity, one of them being Peter. So I'm going to try to be organizing basically a debate in the 42nd district uh, with PDA, maybe some other progressive organizations. And if anybody here wants to help out with that process, if anybody wants to step up and assist in us putting on a debate among the can for the candidates, Democratic we only endorse Democrats at PDA. It's in our name. I think people can understand that. Um, we will endorse in general elections people who are independents if they promise to caucus with the Democratic Party. Hence, we do endorse Bernie Sanders in Vermont, for instance. Um, but um, yeah, we would love to put on a debate among the Democratic candidates running in the 42nd district. That was Lowenthal's district. Of course, the district lines got redrawn. There are a number of people running there, Reverend Moses Somerville, Peter Matthews, and then two Garcias, who both have considerable establishment backing, the mayor of Long Beach and Assemblywoman Christina Garcia. We'd love to bring the four of them together. I hope Peter would be amenable to the proposal. 
in the 42nd, right? Yeah. Yes, to get a good debate going. Now, of course, we've had a number, um, I'm sorry about what's happening off stage, but this is uh, an event where people are being asked to be vaccinated. That's a little, a little rough and unfortunate, but alas, uh, someone was unwilling to leave per the host. So sorry about that, uh, a kerfuffle off screen. Um, for the people who are watching the town hall. Okay, we just had a town hall with Doyle Canning. I don't know, does everybody know who Doyle Canning is? See, they don't. This is a problem we face in this country here right now, folks, which is that we have two different kinds of elections. We have elections in which there's a presidential election taking place, in which the general public uh, focuses upon uh, the election, and the attention can spill over to other candidates. Right now, with the collapse of local journalism, we have a situation in a midterm election year where insurgent candidates running against rotten incumbents have a very, 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 very difficult time getting the word out about their candidacy. And you have open seats. You have candidates who have a very difficult time getting the word out. Well, Peter DeFazio has stepped down as the longtime congressman in Oregon's fourth. And we just had our town hall with Doyle Canning, who will singularly enter the Congress as probably the leading climate emergency and climate activist in the country. She's a brilliant candidate and she has a political messaging background and we just had her on our town hall. So to get the word out about her. And on Wednesday night, we're gonna have a national fundraiser for Senator Nina Turner. Who here has heard of Senator Nina Turner? Sort of proving the case because of course she's famous because she was a surrogate in a presidential campaign. So. By the way, Dolores Huerta is in the front row right here. Next. Yes. yes, and she's coming up next. So everybody stick around for that. And I am honored to know Dolores both as a family friend and as one of the greatest political allies anyone could have in the world. And it's just gonna be a tremendous honor to hear from Dolores Huerta. But let me say what I can about Creep, okay? What these guys are doing is so exemplary. I mean, what comes together every Monday on a national town hall, if you care about having an honest democracy in this country, you gotta know about GREEP. You gotta know about the work that people like Andrea Miller and Harvey Wasserman and Joel Siegel, and boy, what they're bringing forward on the as a ballot proposal in Arizona through the work of John Brakey. I mean, this addresses all of the issues that people have. I mean, they've thought through what it means to have computerized voting. What does it take to have certainty about the vote that you are casting? These guys have thought through it. They're experts on the subject, and what they're proposing is the most exemplary just instance I have seen yet to date, okay? Now, going forward in this year, we need to push to get out the vote this year. I mean, we as Progressive Democrats of America, here's what we are all about right now. We're about getting as many progressives onto the general election ballot in November. Between now and the end of the primary season, we are gonna be championing great candidates like Nina Turner, Doyle Canning, Greg Kassar, who just won, or basically won his seat down in Texas, Jessica Cisneros against uh, Henry Cuellar down in South Texas, Jasmine Crockett up in the Dallas area. We're gonna be endorsing great progressive incumbents as we move the Democratic Party to be truly a party for the people and for the planet, folks. But we are also a, an organization that understands fully that the Republican Party right now is a threat to the very existence of a democratic society that we've grown up in. And come November, we have to make sure that we can hold on to a House majority. We can expand the Democratic majority, which we can do in this election cycle, past 52 to marginalize Democrats who I would really choke on saying they're our friends, Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. So we get to 52, we can move the, the president's agenda, a progressive agenda through both houses, uh, through reconciliation and through the house and break the, uh, the constraints of the filibuster to get democratic reform in our country. And just that's what we're about at PDA. And in November, we're gonna have to educate the population about how to vote, the restrictions around the country in state after state that Republicans have imposed. What Mimi talked about, we're gonna revive our uh, calendar site and we're gonna work with incredible allies like Dolores Huerta, like the great Christian Nunez who is here in person with us tonight, the president of now the National Organization of Women and Andrea Miller, who I think is gonna join us remotely from the uh, Center for Common Ground. And you, Harvey. <laughs> Don't think about it. Just one of the great great organizers of his generation and all generations. Thank you, Harvey.
Alan, it's really an honor. And it, uh, Alan is the reason we're on Zoom today. So we have many, many people. Uh, like I say, we've we've overtaken the Academy Awards. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. All right. And I, I, I had a statue for you, but... But, um, uh, you know, it's gone away. So, listen, uh, we have a great program. Uh, we are completely honored by Dolores Huerta, who will be followed by Mana Demacy and uh, uh, Christian Nunez. Joel Siegel is going to introduce them. Uh, we have Julie Levine and so many other John Brakey uh, that we're going to do when we break into a roundtable. I do have a really important question to ask you. How many of you would like pizza? Should we order in some pizzas to keep going? What do you think? Vegan pizzas. Not my, vegan pizzas, okay. We'll order in some vegan pizzas uh, to keep us going from uh, falling over. Okay, so the next up, uh, and it, we could not really do better than Dolores Huerta. I can't even begin to uh, 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 introduce Dolores Huerta, and uh, so I'm turning it over to someone who can. Do you want me to move the mic down? Are you good to get up here? Okay, this is, this is Tatanka Bricka, um, a former uh, offensive lineman for the Cleveland Browns, and, <laughs> and I, couldn't, I couldn't even begin to introduce this guy, so I'm going to let you talk away. He is a magnificent activist, and he will introduce Doris, then Joel will introduce Christian and Mena, and we're going to keep on rolling, so thank you. Thank you, Harvey Slugger Wasserman, former quarterback for Michigan. <laughs> me, me and Tom Brady. You and Tom Brady, that's right. <laughs> Well, this is quite an honor. Um, you all know who Dolores Huerta is. That's right. So, what can I say? Um, Dolores is now 72. Her 55th birthday, we did a birthday party for her, and we were brainstorming about themes. And the theme came up because when you see the the movement that her foundation has created, it's all about young people. People of all ages, but she inspires the younger generations in the Central Valley, especially young Latino women, but Latino women, but all, everyone. So anyway, the phrase went out, pass the torch. Dolores's response, no, you don't. I'm not ready to pass the torch. We can share the torch. That's, that, that tells you a lot about Dolores. Um, we are gonna hear from Danny Sheehan and Sarah Nelson later in the program, whom I am here working with, with Dolores. The Romero Foundation and the Dolores Huerta Foundation working together on the climate crisis. And well, I, I, think, I think I'll leave it at that. So Dolores, uh, beloved by the whole nation and the world, champion of women, champion of human rights, champion of labor, champion, champion of the next generation. Yes. Will you please welcome the incredible, si se puede, she invented it, Dolores Huerta. Thank you very much. Uh, this is quite an honor to be here with you on this. I want to say this is a historic moment. Uh, you know, I, I always like to remind, uh, C I remember Caesar, what he would say to students when he was asking them to join the movement. And he would say, when you're in college, you can read about history, you can learn about history, you can write about history, but when you join the movement, you can make history. That's right. You can make history. And that is what we are doing here today. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm calling you, and Lee Kennedy will remember my son Ricky, who would say, a voice from the San Joaquin, a voice from the San Joaquin Valley of California. I live in Kevin McCarthy's district, okay? And uh, this, as we know, is oil land. You know, uh, Bakersfield, California produces, I think, close to 70% of all the petroleum uh, in the United States. I cannot tell you how our air is so polluted that one of our committees that we have that works with us, they actually had to pass a petition uh, to build a brand new gymnasium because the air is so bad that the kids could not go out and play. Uh, you know, they, during recess, uh, lunch, they couldn't go out and play. This is how bad it is. And when Mimi, Mimi was talking about the great speech that Mimi made, let's give her a big applause. Mimi Kennedy. <laughs> it 
she was talking about all of the wars. And we know that there is one issue in all of these wars in that the, in Afghanistan, you know, the war in Afghanistan. What was it about? It was about oil. Uh, yeah, a lot of what is happening right now in the Ukraine with Russia is about oil. So we know that oil has become the enemy uh, of the people. And especially when we come to talk about global warming and the illnesses uh, that cause, you know, children in the South King Valley that have all of these illnesses that come from oil. So this is why this is so important, this venture that, we're go that Danny and Sarah are going to be talking about today. And it's why it is so important that all of us get on board uh, to make sure that we can do something about the oil pollution, pollution and, and save the planet for our children and our grandchildren, right? And their grandchildren, because otherwise we know it's not going to happen. Uh, in Bakersfield, California, again, we had over 100 days where we had that the climate was so hot and so bad. Bakersfield, California, I think in 2018 or 2019, was the city that had the hottest temperature in the United States of America. And why? Because it, the, the, it doesn't cool down at night, it still stays hot. And so when we think of Palm Springs, what was it last year, where the uh, temperature went up to 120 degrees in Palm Springs, California? I mean, we know that the signs are all around us and that we have to do something and we have to do something fast. So this great initiative that Danny Sheehan and uh, Sarah Nelson have come up with and we're very happy to be able to partner with them. I think this is one of the answers that we need. And uh, the one good, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna steal, steal Danny's thunder because I know that he is going to lay it all out for us. But the one thing that we have to do is we have to become the organizers that are going to help him make it happen. We have to do everything that we can to raise some money uh, because we know what the plan that he has going to community colleges all over the state of California to organize the young people to come out there because we know that this is their fight. They have made that very, very visible, very prominent but we have to show them, okay, we have a vehicle in the state legislature so that we can get behind that vehicle and this is a way that we can make it happen, okay? So we know that we can make it happen. I do want to say a few words about Women's History Month. The Women's History Month is important and uh, uh, Mimi mentioned what was happening to our Supreme Court Justice nominee, Ms. Jackson. How many of us saw that on television? Wasn't that disgusting? I mean, I think that was like a, a verbal lynching, what they did to her. I know I was so angry that I want to go to Texas and get rid of some of those senators, okay? <laughs> I think we need, to do a, we need to do a Freedom Summer in Texas. Uh, and because she was treated that way, not only because she's a black woman, because she is a woman. And that, you know, they, they put all of that verbal abuse on her. And this is something that we have to really continue to fight uh, uh, to make sure that we have women also elected to office. And I'm going to mention one of them, and I did tell Mr. Matthews about this, but Christina Garcia, who was also running uh, for that congressional seat, when she was in the California legislature, she passed a bill, an environmental bill, and the building trades were so angry with her that they went after her. They spent millions of dollars uh, uh, to defeat her, and guess what? She won with 70% of the vote. 70% of the world, okay? <laughs> and she's also been a big champion for women. And, and it's really, really important that we do elect progressives. Thank you for having your progressive party, progressive Democratic Party, because we have so many people that are not progressives. Uh, they're Democrats, but when we need their vote, they're not there. And we get that disappointment over and over again. And one of those, and I'm gonna mention names here, okay? We've been mentioning names, I'm gonna mention names too. And I'm gonna mention that I am supporting Karen Bass for the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. I've known Kevin DeLeon since he was a young man. I remember the way that he treated Diane Feinstein when she was running for the Senate. Again, a lot of verbal abuse aimed at our esteemed state senator. There was no cause to do that. I think that uh, Kevin is a politically immature, and we need a strong leader for the city of Los Angeles, again, to fight for the environmental issues that we need, right? 
to right for those environments, environmental issues uh, as we need and all of the is other issues that, that, that plague the city of Los Angeles. So anyway, that's where I'm at and I hope some of you can join me. But the main thing that we have to work on that we're talking about today, we have to see what we can do. All of us, we have to commit our resources. We have to make a commitment that we're going to do as much as we can to support Danny Sheehan, Sarah Nelson, the Romero Institute, and everybody out, out there that is working for climate change. Se puede o no se puede? And I, I always like to end my talks by saying one simple thing. I would like to ask all of you to stand up, please, if you can. Stand up. And then I'm going to ask you the question. We know what we have to do. We know that we have to work very hard. But I'm going to ask you the question. Okay, who's got the power? I want you to say, we've got the power. We've got the power. And then I'm going to say, what kind of power? I'm going to say, people power. People, people power. power. Okay, let's do it one more time. Uh, and as loud as we can. Who's got the power? We've got the power. What kind of power? People power. So are we going to use our power to make sure that we pass this piece of legislation? Yeah. In the, in the Sacramento legislature, okay? Yeah. Se puede or no se puede? Sí, sí, sí. All right, thank you very much and good luck to all of you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. It's amazing to be able to hear Dolores Huerta. Thank you again, Dolores, for coming so much. I do want to mention, uh, um, since you mentioned power, this is a book by my buddy, Den Dennis uh, Kucinich, uh, 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 who's been here before. It's called The Division of Light and Power. Uh, Dennis is a very cool guy. I wish he was going to be the next mayor of Cleveland, but he's not here today. But I did want to mention this. Now we have two incredible speakers. Uh, uh, Joel Siegel is going to introduce uh, Christian Nunez and Den uh, Dennis <laughs> Demacy. Um, uh, and we're incredibly honored to have them. And we're incredibly, Julie Levine will be speaking later, um, uh, maybe Ale, maybe Peter Matthews, John Brakey. Uh, we have a really amazing group of people here that we'll be meeting with in a round table as we continue. We, we are Zooming again, so uh, we, there's quite a lot more people. Unfortunately, they can't be here. How could it be better than here? And Jan Goodman is going to join us uh, soon also. So. I got Joel Siegel here. Joel's my buddy. He is was the chief uh, um, guy with John Conyers. He is literally the guy responsible for the Affordable Care Act, which he wrote, and he got it through Congress. And so, uh, Joel, if you'll come on up, um, and give us your talk, and introduce these wonderful women. We appreciate it. I do want to mention by one quick thing: um, when when uh, Shirley Chisholm ran for president in 1972. She was the first, and I want to mention Ruth Strauss is here. <laughs> anyway, we, 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 when she ran for president, she was asked, where did she get more pushback, as a black person or as a woman? And she did not hesitate. Which do you think it was? As a woman, absolutely. So, you know, there's nothing that terrifies the right wing more than a powerful woman. Okay, Joel, you're going to introduce two of the most powerful women that ever lived, followed by one of the most powerful that ever lived. So you got a, you got a heavy load here, brother. Good afternoon. I'm from North Carolina, so we say, how y'all doing? You say, I'm all right. Where's Dolores? Where's Dolores? She's there. All right, Dolores, just take 30 seconds. Now, when I first met Dolores, I was with Congressman Conyers, and we were working on the Affordable Care Act. We were pushing Medicare for all single payer. The uh, Affordable Care Act was the result of single payer. So Dolores walked in to my office, and I said, um, his name was Sal Alvarez, may he rest in peace. So he said, this is Dolores Huerta. And I'm like, you know, like the Dolores Huerta, who I grew up reading about? <laughs> I said, I'm a little bit nervous. And she grabbed my shoulder, and she says, look, Joe, I'm an organizer like you. This is an historical woman. Can we give her a round of applause? Yeah. Um, the reason why I, I love her so much, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I moved to take care of a family member who got sick because we don't have housing for sick people in America. And I was at, it was the ice, we were protesting ice. And Dolores kept looking at me. 
She said, where do I know you from? I said, from Congressman Conyers office. She said, you wanna have lunch? I said, sure. So we went to a Mexican restaurant. There were about 80 people in the restaurant and Dolores was there with everyone and she was everybody's mother and everybody's grandmother. And the reason, I'm gonna get upset. I never get upset. The reason why I love this woman, she never puts herself above anybody because she's with the people. And we have to have more activists like Dolores and Harvey because she's with the people, not above the people. And, and if there's anything I'll say about Dolores and Tatanka and Danny is you got to be fighting for the people. That's why we're here. Am I right, Dolores? Well, you're one of the reasons why I do this work. <laughs> so I'm just so glad that Dolores, that you're here. And now Dolores flipped many members of the Hispanic Caucus. I'm gonna just tell you a quick story and then I'm gonna introduce our guest. What happened was Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff for Obama, was going to withdraw the Affordable Care Act um, because he thought we would lose the midterms and the House would go Republican. Dolores and I, worked to flip members of Congress who were going to vote no. I, <laughs> Connors, I love Connors, he's not here anymore, God bless him. But I, I got together with his donors and his key activists and I said, you got to meet with Mr. Connors, he's going to vote no. Because he didn't want to give billions of dollars to the insurance companies, I understood that. And I heard him talking to um, Physicians for a National Health Program, the president, and um, he said, what would Martin King do? What would Mandela do? Because he worked with Mandela and he worked with Martin King, was Martin King's attorney. He was struggling with the Affordable Care Act. So I was like, sir, I grew up uninsured. I almost died because I was uninsured. And there's millions of people uninsured. Let's just get started. Let's pass this bill. We can get to single payer, but let's get started. And the reason why there was Medicaid expansion, which was a part of the bill that I helped draft, was because I knew that I didn't want to see people die because they were uninsured, okay? It was that simple. Did I get my butt kicked and crucified by a lot of people in a single pair? I did, but you know what? When I was uninsured and homeless and, I, and doctors wouldn't see me, I just needed a card to get into that doctor's office. I didn't care if it said Medicare. I didn't care what it said. But Dolores, I want to thank you. If Dolores had not flipped the members of the Hispanic Caucus. We would have never passed that bill. No one knows us about her because she's so humble, but thank you for passing the Affordable Care Act. Yes, that was you. And when I, I am writing a history of the Affordable Care Act and Medicare for All, and there's a big chapter on Dolores. So I just want to let you know that, okay. So um, before I introduce our special guest, and there's, you know, every time I come to Los Angeles, it's like a combination of like Woodstock, Haight-Ashbury, and it's, <laughs> Uh, I was at Dorothy Reich, the great Dorothy Reich, uh, at one of her parties. Yeah, she deserves a round of applause. But every time I come here, I get so much love from people like, hey, thank you so much for the work that you do. But where I live in North Carolina, which is, you know, kind of Republican, kind of redneck, they're like, so you're the one that worked on the Affordable Care Act, huh? I'm like, dude, don't be mad at me, okay? I just want people to get insurance. Um, but it's so good to be here. But we got to give a round of applause um, to the people who are responsible for this. Jerry Manpool, is it Manpool? Yeah. Right, Manpearl. Man Sorry, God. Um, and, um, and, and Jan Goodman, could, could, can you stand up please, Jan? So like, you know, Jan's been trying to save Pacific Radio. She holds all these kind of fundraisers all the time, but she's like one of the most incredible people, her and her husband, and um, because she, she, she lifts people up all the time who are progressives, but you know, plus, is this, a, we, I'm a musician, so we say this is a nice crib. Is this a nice crib or what? It's yeah. a beautiful place. Right? All right, so um, there's a person who was supposed to be here that couldn't make it. Um, and the reason why she, she couldn't make it was because uh, she had some, um, uh, you know, other obligations. And um, I'm going to talk about her in, in about a you know, minute or two. But um, I want to thank, where's Alan Minsky? Uh, give Alan a round of applause. Um, I'm the co-founder of Progressive Democrats of America with Tim Carpenter and Mimi Kennedy. Mimi. And I, went, I met Mimi and I'm like, man, you are really cool, you know. And I said, I think I'll work in this, this PDA. And um, 
she was the first chair, I was the first vice chair. And when Tim Carpenter died, may rest in peace, I, we didn't know what was gonna happen to PDA, but Alan Minsky and all the people in PDA, they kept it together. And we gotta have progressives in Congress because we can work on progressive things. But if we don't have people who are progressive in the House and the Senate, we're not gonna get much done, right? right. So Alan, you know, you're kind of low key dude and all that, but I love you, man. And so does everybody here. So, and you also love uh, basketball too. So, um, but anyway, Andrew Miller was gonna be here. She's executive director of the Center for Common Ground. And what, yeah, and what Andrew is doing is really cool. She's starting democracy centers uh, in inner city neighborhoods, predominantly African-American neighborhoods in the South where there's low voter turnout. So she's really taking kind of a model of the Black Panthers and it's now like 2022 Black Panthers. Uh, they're getting to know the people in these democracy centers, making sure people have food and healthcare and gaining their trust. Then they're getting them out to vote. And if we don't, we got to start funding the democracy centers. I think that's the future. The reason why there's a lot of, yes, the future. The re reason why there's a lot of low voter turnout is a lot of Democrats who run for Congress don't vote on issues that people who are low income and communities of color care about. Universal child care, jobs for all, health care for all, right? Yeah. Transportation for all, social security that you can live on. Democrats got to run as big D Democrats, not as moderate Republicans. So these democracy centers are extremely important. She couldn't be here, but I wanted to at least, you know, let you know that she's organizing democracy centers all across the country. I think it's a political uh, revolution. All right. Now, where's Harvey? All right. My brother from another mother. Um, what Harvey has done with this grassroots election protection coalition is very important. So every Monday at five o'clock, we have a call with activists across the country. And for years, I've been a little bit critical of the left, of which I'm a part of, um, and saying we're, there's too many silos. And there is something called the nonprofit industrial complex. Yes. Can I get an amen? You know what that is? Yeah. All right. The nonprofit industrial complex is not capable of starting a revolutionary progressive movement for the people because there's often a fiduciary incentive in their minds, which is not true, to look after their own self-interest. What, what this man has done is he's bringing together activists from all across the country, from California to North Carolina, in a solidarity call, and it's you know election protection, it's climate change, it's you know so many different issues and we're starting to you know, come together. And we need to keep this organization viable. I think you know what I mean, economically viable. Yeah. Please support the Grassroots Election Protection Coalition. There will be another Harvey Wasserman. Uh, his new book that he's written is probably one of the most incredible history books that I've ever read. And when I was in college, like you weren't hip unless you had his history book, right? And, you know, but when I met him, I was kind of nervous. So I was at his house staying with him. Mimi said, you can stay with you know, Harvey because she had some other people stay with her. And, and I'm like, man, you're talking about the Harvey Wasserman? So I walked in and I was a little nervous, you know, kind of a, like a legendary dude, you know, like Danny Sheehan, legendary dude. And um, so um, he said, come out by the pool. I said, all right. So he <laughs> takes his shirt off and just jumps into the pool. I'm like, this guy's cool. And we got this Jewish man thing going on where we, you know, we joke and kibitz. Does anybody know what kibitz means? Raise your hand. All right. Kibitz is when you, you're getting serious, but then you joke all the time. And we, so we were serious, then we joke, then we're serious, then we joke. And uh, he's also a great professor, but his history book, where's your history book? It's around there somewhere. Yeah, his new people's history is pretty incredible. I think they're um, burning it now. They're not burning it now. That, that's, that, that would be what Trump would do, is burn shit. I mean, I'm sorry, so. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest, but Thank you, Joel. Harvey Wasserman, round of applause. Yeah. One thing that Harvey has taught me and teaching all of us, we must defend democracy from the far right wing extremists. Yes. The elect, as long as we have the electoral college, a fascist can come in. Not like that ever happened before. Yeah. Remember Donald Trump? Okay. So we got to get rid of the Electoral College. We have, to, we have to get rid of gerrymandering. It's racist. It's Jim Crow. As long as you have gerrymandering, we're not going to have a true democracy. We need publicly financed campaigns. Can I get yes. an amen? Yes. Money should not control politics. All because 
you can't allow TV, TV broadcast stations to hijack our democracy. This guy right here, Brother Peter, let me tell you something, man. They used to run congressional campaigns. Most of the money that's raised is for the TV commercials. They ought to be free. They ought to be free. The, our politics are being hijacked for profit by TV broadcast companies. That's wrong. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Corporate, right on, corporate owned media. Now, Mena Demacy, I met her when I, uh, she used to be, she was, a, she was a congressional fellow for Barbara Lee, and as soon as I met her, fell in love with her soul, fell in love with her mind. Uh, she's, she's a professor, at University of California, Washington. Are you at Berkeley now? Very cool. Um, probably one of my best friends. She's the, you know, you know, one of my sisters that I from Ethiopia that I never would have had. <laughs> and uh, her mother's really cool too. Um, but um, she's doing extremely important uh, work on racial justice, Black Lives Matter. At, you name it, she's working on it. Um, and she came here. It's very busy. She's now working with artists and musicians to bring them in to social justice, so thank you. Um, she's the former executive vice president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. You survived, congratulations. And, um, <laughs> but without further ado, she's gonna you know, share some of her uh, thoughts with you, but I'm so honored to be here, thank you. The sunlight is really giving all Thank you, Brother Joel, and uh, great to see these beautiful faces. It's always a pleasure to be among like-minded folks, and the more I hear people talk, I'm just thinking about how there's nothing more traditional in American democracy than a dose of good progressive activism, right? Like, if you actually look at the history of American democracy, it was predicated on people like you, people who pushed against the grain, people who fought for voting rights, Right? Um, I'm currently teaching a course on Black Lives Matter uh, as if, um, and race policy, democratic governance. And what we know is that this movement has been happening for inclusive racial justice for, for decades, right? I mean, think about the Civil War amendments. I'm always telling, you, you can get into an American history or government class and they'll talk to you about the Civil War, talk to you about American government and leave race, justice, and freedom completely out of the conversation. But if there was ever a foundational benchmark of what a Black Lives Matter movement looked like, you can go back to the slave rebellions that made us all free. My parents from Ethiopia would not be in this country if it weren't for African Americans who fought against the grain, right, um, for a more inclusive democracy that treated human beings like human beings, right? And so if I've learned anything from being with people like Joel, working for people like Congressman Barbara Lee, heading up the policy department for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, my former position, which allowed me to engage with our CBC counterparts doing amazing work, pushing against the grain. Um, I would not be where I am today, being among these folks and understanding that there is power in the people. Um, it, it's really important for us to get that uh, as we are in this post-civil right. It's kind of ironic, right? You know. Uh, President Trump comes to the fore, and, and ironically, we're able to talk more openly about what white supremacy looks like. Uh, you know, but these things have been here before. And if we know anything, we should know that the power of us to come together across race, gender, ethnicity, uh, immigration status for a better inclusive democracy, it's actually, there's nothing more traditional than that, to be a progressive in that sense. So we're not outsiders, uh, we're not the extremists, we're the promoters of an inclusive democracy, and we know what that looks like when we reflect on amazing leaders like Dolores Huerta and Mimi Kennedy and Joel Siegel and Harvey Wasserman. So this gives me hope. Um, I actually remember a lot of memories with Joel. One was around under the Obama administration when, the, when he helped start the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus uh, with the late, great Congressman John Lewis, and we were all in that room to launch this caucus. And it was powerful to see people like yourselves in that room, but it was also a little frustrating that we have to create these spaces to advocate for things that are right, righteously ours already. Um, this stuff is scary. Uh, we all, we are now voting without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. It was actually more secure in 1965 
than it is going to be in 2022 as it was since Shelby versus Holder in or Shelby um, in uh, 2013, right? Uh, this is scary stuff. So, um, and, and it's up against the backdrop where people are saying racism doesn't exist, sexism doesn't exist, everyone can go to the polls. We've had the first black president, what are you talking about racism doesn't exist? As a political scientist, I always say go to the data. Uh, because I'm not here talking about anything more than fact. It is not my opinion that racism separates people. It is a fact. Look at the data. I don't want race to continue to explain outcomes in housing and health care and criminal justice. Um, I, I don't want it to explain it. But when we look at it, there's con considerably a disproportionate effect on the same communities that we continue to fight for in 2022. Um, this is a problem, right? So, so go back to what we know. We know that if it weren't for slave rebellions, if it weren't for the Civil War, we would not have the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that, that abolishes slavery. We wouldn't have one of the most fundamental amendments that allow all of us to do this work, and that's the 14th Amendment, Equal Protection Clause, on the backs of people who were fighting for it that were considered chattel slavery. So imagine if the progressives of, of that time didn't do their due diligence, we would not be here. Um, so again, nothing more traditional in, 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 in uh, American democracy than a good dose of progressive activism. It's what got here today, 15th Amendment. I always say, you know, these amendments are, democracy is a, is a project, right? So with, with every amendment to the Constitution, it was an approach to try to do better uh, in democracy. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these amendments. But if a 15th Amendment <laughs> existed uh, to give women the right to vote um, as recently as 1920, it's because there was a, system in this place that ostracized women from voting, right? If there's an equal protection law uh, uh, clause, it's because it didn't exist for all people. And if um, the 13th Amendment was here, it's because there was a system known as slavery that op oppressed people. So to have a conversation about voting rights without understanding how race and racism continue to play a fundamental role in outcomes, you know, it's a problem. And we're in a post-civil rights era, right? So 50 years ago, before my time, you knew who was against you because they said it loud and proud. You can't do that anymore. It's unconstitutional. So now we have a covert systemic effort uh, of oppression, racism, sexism, that is chopping at us by the bit. So you can talk about voter uh, restrictive laws. And, and actually, a lot of this started after Obama showcased how progressives could come out and vote 130 million plus. That scared the crap out of a lot of people. <laughs> and 30 some Republican governed states at the time started to introduce these voter restrictive bills, right? Um, without any evidence of voter fraud, it, it's mind boggling that we're even talking about this. It's mind boggling that the Voting Rights Act was repealed. I mean, at this point we should be celebrating a more inclusive uh, access to voting, but instead, we are fighting bills that uh, in, in the state of Texas that are going to criminalize people who want to give water to folks in line, right? This is, this is where we are at in present day. So we have to call it what it is. Yeah. Um, we have to not only tell people to vote, but tell them what to vote for. And if they don't vote, what is at risk, right? Um, and this is hard to do because uh, there are systems and people against us uh, and you know we we have made progress, but but we are um, we are in a more dangerous uh, situation here because uh, it's easier to say things are okay. Uh, we we've made progress, but if you actually look at these restrictive voting bills, they're do, doing everything in its power, and they are succeeding in marginalizing black and brown people, low income people, um, progressives all across the country. Uh, so we really need to speak out to that. I mean, John Lewis of all, he said, you know, the most powerful, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have for change. Um, but we have to be loud about it. We have to call people out. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be among people uh, like both Harvey and, and Joel who are out here trying to make a difference. But I will say that um, it, we need to do this together. Sure. I, I have power and faith in young people. I teach mostly Latino, Asian, and white students through the UC s system. And 10 years ago, it was hard for me to teach a class where people didn't take these things personally. Now, 
I'm telling you, these kids look like you and me. They are ready for the good fight. Maybe it's something that you guys got in the water here out in California, but <laughs> change is happening. Um, and, and if anything, progressives have, sh have shown that the more of us that show up to vote, the more we get what we want, right? So th there's, a, there's a reason for that, and there's a reason for that pushback. So I will stop there, but I want to say keep up the good fight uh, because progress being a progressive is in our blood. It's what makes our democracy better. Right. And it's there's nothing more mainstream than being a good old progressive activist. So we ain't gonna stop. So let's show up to the polls. Let's make sure we do it together and let's speak out and be the change we wanna see. Thanks guys. Yeah. 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 Meta, that's pretty incredible, man. I'm glad that you're young because I'm, I'm getting old. And, uh, we, need, we need younger people. Um, before I introduce one of our keynote speakers, um, I do want to mention that if you read the most recent science on climate change, every scientist that's a scientist that works on climate change is saying that we have less than 10 years to save civilization. Well, why is that? If we continue to burn fossil fuels, oil and gas, we don't regulate agricultural emissions, we're not going, we, we will experience the apocalyptic doom. And if any of you have not read Dr. Michael Mann's books, please read anything by Dr. Michael Mann. Scientists are not wrong, okay? Um, if, if you watched Al Gore's movie, um, Inconvenient Truth, everything that was in the movie has come true. So, the, the biggest fear is we're going to run out of water. If you run out of water, you cannot grow crops. If you cannot grow crops, then we're gonna starve. We've got to wake up. You're gonna hear from um, Danny Sheehan, Sarah as well, right? Sarah Nelson. Sarah Nelson. Now, they're, they're, they have an initiative to make California go 100% clean, renewable energy. Tatanka Bricka, my hero, is um, working with Dolores Huerta, to make this happen, to pass this in the state legislature. Everybody here, you gotta get behind this bill. Because if it's passed in California, then it'll be, it could be passed across the country, a multiplier effect. Yes. And then I, I, I'm working with the Princess of Ghana, Princess Okanse, she wants to replicate the California bill in Ghana. Ain't that cool? Yeah. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So I work with Professor Mark Jacobson, been working with him for many years, Read the Solutions Project. Mark Jacobson has a plan to go to 100% cleanable energy in every state in the country and every country in the world. I, I was working on climate change for a very long time in North Carolina. We actually got the city of Charlotte, where Duke Energy is, to go to 100% clean renewable energy and the transportation and energy sectors. Guess who opposed us? Our mayor. Our mayor. She's probably mad at me for saying this, but... Um, before we voted, and I love her a lot, right? But she w she kept walking off the stage every time we're about to vote for this this um, this plan. And Al Gore's been trumpeting our success. I, le I led that effort. It was the hardest thing I have ever done in my life because there was so much opposition to it. But I organized the business community, the interfaith community, the African American community. To this is what I learned from Congressman John Conyers. You got to organize, man. But you got to you got to help with this California Green Initiative. Get your checkbook out, man, and start, you know, you gotta fund this. Because I really, look, Danny Sheehan, when I was in law school, Danny Sheehan was the closest thing to Moses or, you know, Gandhi, right? right. And, and here he is, like, sitting, you know, right behind me here, and uh, in front of me. And um, I went to law because of Danny Sheehan. And, and um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and if anyone can do it, it's, you know, Tatanka, Danny, Sarah, big hand. You're going to save our planet. All right. Now, this woman needs no introduction. She's one of my best friends and my sister. She is the president of the National Organization for Women, Christian Nunez. Just want to let you know what she's been doing for the National Organization, National Organization for Women is she's really um, making sure that the organization also deals with Black Lives Matter and social and economic justice. And it ain't easy, it's not easy. And she's doing it. Um, 
Because of GREEP, the Grassroots Election Protection Coalition, I saw her name in the little square from the Zoom, and it said Christian Nunez, and I thought it looked now. So anyway, in the chat, I said, hey, are you like the president now? Anyway, we got together. Turned out we had a lot in common. I asked her to join the board of directors for the National Coalition for the Homeless, which I'm a part of. And um, she, she, she's about to launch the movement to end homelessness for women, families, and children. Christian Nunes, come on up. Come on up, the floor is yours. Well, we'll just turn to the side because I'm 6'1". And um, <laughs> uh, all these Zoom calls, you only see my head and my neck. <laughs> so, okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you all of you today. Thank you, Jan and Jerry, for hosting Grief PDA. All the wonderful activists that are here, Joel, Harvey. Um, it is just such a pleasure to be here. Um, National Organization for Women, thank you for allowing me to have the platform to interact with so many wonderful activists and advocates who are here to really help us get our democracy in line. So today I'm gonna do a little bit of different talk and it's still about progressive, um, about our democracy, it's still about our elections but I want to come from you for a different perspective, right? It's not really church. <laughs> We're here on Sunday. But what I want to do is I want us to talk about two important questions that I think it's really important that we really think about when we're talking about our democracy. Um, and I say these things because I think sometimes we get miscentered, right? Um, and when we're talking about save our democracy, I hear this a lot, save our democracy, save our democracy, save our democracy. But are we really trying to save our democracy? Because the democracy that we've been having, it keeps bringing us back to the same thing over and over again. We are here, back here where we are, because the democracy that was originally founded as Stardust was centered in patriarchy, white supremacy, and oppression. So do we really want to save that? And, I, and I, so I'm questioning you all to think about that. What we really should be doing is dismantling reconstructuring so that we really can save a democracy. So that's my question for you today. My first question is, what are all you want to do to help us reconstruct our democracy so that we can save our democracy? Amen. That's the first thing. Because as we are all here today, a lot of times we get lost in the idea that it becomes a political thing. We say, progressives versus Republicans versus right stream versus left, left extremists and things like that. And yes, we can clearly see <laughs> that there has been a lot on the right left, the, you know, the right side extremists that have been doing a lot of this cause, you know, but we also can also see that there are some on our side too that have not been doing what they need to do, right? I'm not going to name any names. We know who they are, right? But what we have to really truly acknowledge is that we all have responsibility and accountability to making sure that we are in this cause together. And we are working together to make sure that we are taking our initiatives and we're walking and we're working in our purpose. So my second question for you today is what legacy do you want to leave behind? What legacy do you want to leave behind when we're thinking about our, the democracy we're leading for the next generation? Because that is what's going to matter. When we sit here and we're talking, we're working about voter protection and elections, how do we really truly do that if we're not truly dedicated and committed to the purpose we all got into this work before originally? When I ask you, Joel, why did you get in this work? Black Lives Matter. Harvey, why did you get in this work? Nuclear power. Okay. Carol, why did you get in this work? Bringing all people together from every background and race and religion to be one human family. Okay, one human family. Okay. Minna, why'd you get in this work? Okay. And Mimi, why'd you get in this work? Okay. So these are some great answers. But what we have to remember is that purpose we got into this work for. And even though it may be different, we have to de-silo. That's right. 
We have to get out of our silos and remember we're all in this for a collective purpose, for equity and justice. We're all in this to heal. We're all in this to transform. We are all in this to make changes because those changes is what's gonna save this world. It's gonna save our democracy. It's gonna make a difference. And in all these different issues we have underneath, underneath it all, it's all about humanity, right? And when we look at this all too, we have to look at our rights. All of our rights are extremely linked, right? So we can look at voting rights, we can look at reproductive rights, we can look at climate justice, we can look at LGBTQIA rights. It's all about equity and justice. Oppression is oppression. So when I think about one of my favorite poets and actresses of all time, it's Audrey Lord, and she has this famous statement that says, you know, I'm not free if my sister is unfree. And if she's, you know, and that it's so important that we think about this. And as long as she's bondage and chained, I'm bondage and chained. So if I'm talking about this and we're talking about Black Lives Matter, I can't be over here saying, well, no, 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 that's not my issue. If I'm talking about people who are in the Southern Belt who are dealing with voter suppression and we can't even hand them water to drink, and we're not looking at our elderly who have to go to one voting poll in their whole entire districts because we've eliminated them all out, then how are we really talking about freedom? How are we really talking about equality? How are we really talking about justice? And I'm saying that isn't affecting, yes it does. If one person is oppressed, we are all oppressed. And it is our job and our duty to remember what our purpose is, to remember what we're called here to do. If we're gonna transform this world, we're gonna transform this community, we have to all step in together. We can no longer be siloed. We cannot be siloed. We cannot change this world. We cannot have democracy. We cannot leave the next generation a hot mess. I'm sorry, it's a hot mess right now, right? We cannot leave that for them until we decide to come together collectively. Like Dolores said, people power. And allies, you have an important role in this race. For those who have been oppressed, allies have a, 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 a ability to do some radicalized work to open doors for those who what, been, doors have been closed to the press, right? And it's important to utilize that power. And for those who have been oppressed, you have an important role because you have so much strength and ability to use your narrative to move change and power. But we have to come together. We have to do solo and work it together. So I don't want to go on and on because there's so many powerful speakers today, but we know there were over 389 voter suppression bills that were left, released last summer. We know this. We all know statistics. There are brilliant people in this space. There are over 39 states. I mean, there's just 18 bills or 389 bills or 18 states. There are so much bills that have been released and things going on. We can go on and on and we just know it's a problem. So it's important that we stand up, we remember what we came in this work to do while we're here, and we get it together, we come together, and we make some changes. We need to get organized. We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to dismantle this so-called democracy that we have that has not been working, that has continued to keep everyone oppressed, and we need to really save our democracy. Are y'all in for it? Yes. yes. I don't believe y'all. Yes. I don't believe you. Yes. All right. So I want to see us do some work. These 2022 midterms are going to be a serious midterm. A lot of times we want to ignore. This is not the time to ignore. We have some serious work to do these midterms. So let's come together. Let's not get stuck on who did what what they said, but let's get focused so that we really can leave a serious, healthy democracy for the next generation. Thank you. Well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, thank you so, so much. And uh, I, I wanna say that uh, more food has arrived so we're, unless somebody really wants a pizza, we've got enough food back there uh, to feed you guys, and, and I'm very happy about that. We were going to do a fundraising pitch right now. I want to I want to postpone it a little bit. Uh, no. All right, all right, Jen, come on up. 
I will, very quickly, we're going to raise, we're supporting PDA and uh, Progressive Democrats of America. We're supporting uh, New, New Day Pacifica and also the grassroots emergency. No, what we're supporting is the grassroots emergency. <laughs> emergency election protection, GREEP. Okay, so uh, how many he people here have not uh, been on or heard about the Monday uh, meetings of the GREEP, the Grassroots Election Protection. So there's two people, three. I have, three. but I work. Okay, so, you know, there's a few of you. So uh, let me just tell you, this, this um, it's a Zoom meeting with people from around the country. Uh, important people, like our last guest. Um, like um, Harvey, like <laughs> Mr. Brakey, like, like occasionally Jan Goodman, Tatanka, um, Joel Siegel. Joel Siegel. What, uh, what's the woman next to her? Him? That's name uh, is Mena. Mena Demacy. Mena. Mena Demacy. The thing about it is Tatanka. That, I already said Tatanka, but I'll say Tatanka again. Just you know, he's worth twice. So, but the point is is that people, Ruth Strauss, there are people from around, Danny Sheehan, there are people from around the country that get together to talk about what's happening on the ground about election protection. And this is really an important group of people and it's an important meeting because people come together and they actually talk about what's going on and plans and they cross fertilize each other and get information and um, and act and do actions and plan actions. And, you know, we kind of think, oh, it's the internet, it's Zoom, this doesn't cost anything to do, but that is actually not true. These, you know, organizing takes money. I know that's a, you know, since Jess Unruh said, you know, I believe it was Jess Unruh yeah. who said, uh, that money is the mother's milk of politics. And it's the mother's milk of left-wing politics and right-wing politics. And we, unfortunately, don't have enough of it. It's, you know, it's, actually we do, but it's mostly in our pockets and not out there where it's gonna do some good. So um, what I'm here to do today, right now, is to, first of all, thank everyone for the donations they've already made. When you came in the door, you made a donation, and that is, we are grateful for that. But if, if we are to do the work that has to be done with election protection, we really need more donations. And um, it does not look like we have a lot of people here, but on, online, we have more 114, right now. 114 we've it's been up to 150 yep. there were the pda people there was another probably a couple hundred uh on the pda feed so it looks like we're just us but this is actually spreading out a long way and i think some of this is also going to be repeated on the greet program tomorrow so the point is is that we are a power we are as, as Dolores said, we are people power. We're just a few of us here, but from among us here, we need to raise some more money. And I know that it may sound like a crazy amount of money, and it probably is because we're, you know, I know most of you here, uh, but I, I'm wondering if we could raise $10,000, because if we could raise $10,000, that would really go a long way in in supporting these phone calls that are that are very critical if we're going to do something about the midterms and about the congressional elections in the fall these are this is one big critical part of the of the program so um yes 